Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to be taking a look at the age of affluence in the United States and the early civil rights movement during the 1950s. Now, this is just a sliver of the full civil rights experience. We're just going to take a look at what had been happening in this country in the early 20th and up and through the 50s. We'll have a larger look at the movement during the 60s in a future video. So let's get started. We see that the court case of Plessy v. Ferguson had established legal segregation in this country in the 19th century, but during the early 20th century, the conditions of separate but equal were already being brought to federal and Supreme Court. Uh, University of Missouri, of Missouri Law in 1938 admitted African-American students, but there was not a law school and the student was a, a law student, so you had this very peculiar situation, um, specifically because Missouri said the only school we have is for white students. We don't have one for black students, so it was not separate, it was not existing. And same thing happened a decade later in Oklahoma and a couple of years later in Texas, that equal protection, equal education was not being offered to all citizens. And so, I mean, there had been exposure to this problem. It's not like the problem had, that the civil rights issues just appeared out of, out of nowhere. Fast forward from here to the early 50s, and we get the story on March 2nd, 1955, of a 15-year-old high school kiddo named Claudette Colvin. She is going home with some friends on a bus, and she is African-American. She is sitting in the white section. The white lady gets on. She refuses to move, refuses to give up her seat and she's arrested. 15 year old high school kiddo arrested for this. Now, when she is, sorry, school bell. Uh, now mind you, this doesn't take too long before the local branch of the NAACP hears about this. And you know, this is a terrible incident, but they decide not to make this the boycott moment because number one she's a 15 year old kid in high school and they were worried that this would lead to astigmatism on her for, for the rest of her days um now looking at what happens the same year is the rosa parks incident that happens in december of the same year so only a couple of months later the exact same thing happens and when it happens with rosa parks she's you know, an older woman, so there was a lot better justification to support this as opposed to, you know, a high school kiddo. The bus boycott began in December of that year, and the person who is leading the Montgomery Improvement Association, Montgomery, Alabama, which is where all this is happening, was a 26-year-old Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., president of the Southern Leadership Christian Conference. Now, King's background was all about protesting the segregation issues that had been existing. He had a family of pastors. He had learned and studied and really been motivated by the nonviolent approach that Gandhi had used in India to see Indian independence and believed that he could take that design, intermix it with the role of Christianity in African-American communities, and then use it to fight against this system. And when the bus boycott began, it lasted for more than a year before eventually the city of Montgomery lifted the policy of who can sit where on a bus. 
And during that year that it happened, for lots of people in this community, riding the bus was, was how you got from home to work, to the store, to school, to, to everywhere. So this was a massive impact on the local economy as well as the local lifestyles for most folks. Some employers were, were super willing to work with employees who are, who are running late because now they have to find a new way to get to work. Uh, some employers are not willing to work with their employees. You know, you, it's, you're supposed to be at nine o'clock, you're here at not nine o'clock, so uh, there were carpools that were created. There was a short-lived bus transportation system of African-American owned buses that ran. Um, but the boycott took more than 60% of Montgomery's transit business was now gone. And these buses are still running, so they're running for more than a year with almost nobody on them. It ended. The big thing that happens, and this is much bigger than the buses in the 50s, is desegregation of public schools. And this takes place with the Supreme Court case Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And the court case was all about getting a kid to school. The Brown family lived at the extreme end of the district's pickup spot. The district said to the family, listen, we're not going to send one bus to pick up one kid, your kid, so your kid's going to have to find a different way to get to school. Family argues this is a violation of equal protection under the law. This is a violation of separate but equal. Uh, so we're going to take you to court. And this keeps getting appealed until it gets before the Supreme Court. The NAACP gets involved very early on. Uh, one of their greater lawyers, well, probably one of the greatest lawyers the NAACP has at this time, a man named Thurgood Marshall, challenged the doctrine of separate but equal, not just saying separate but equal with this kid, but separate but equal to all kids. The idea that all of society needs the role of an education, the role of bettering oneself, the role of reaching for something beyond where you are, the goal of being better than you can be. And the Constitution is kind of supposed to provide that, and these institutions are supposed to do this. So the court case in 54 and 55 ends segregation. They say that segregation in schools, specifically public schools, no longer is acceptable, and the court is supposed and says districts are supposed to end segregation quote, with all deliberate speed. Uh, that phrasing, though, was not super conducive, though, because all deliberate speed, you know, left a lot of interpretation up. Does that mean, you know, tomorrow? Does that mean this school year? Does that mean next school year? Does that mean for any future buildings that are built? So some districts, some cities, some states and you can probably imagine where these happen, desegregate at a much slower rate than others. Now this is 55, 54, 55. It really reaches a boiling point in two years later because yes, this is happening kind of, but in 1957 in Little Rock, Arkansas, a new high school is opened. Central High School in Little Rock. 10 African-American students get to go to the new high school, and that's out of the entire community. And just so you're aware, yes, there are more than 10 African-American kids in the entire district. On the very first day that these kids go to the school, 
there is a crowd of protesters, citizens saying, hey, we don't want to see this happen. We don't want to see the kids interacting here. Uh, the police do nothing. So first day, nothing happens. The next day, the National Guard is called out to prevent kids from going to school. And this is really how crazy it's getting that you turn on the television and you see soldiers at a school. Now, today we would think something very specific, but, you know, in 55 it's, and 57, the story of, yeah, these kids want to go to school and they are not being allowed to. Holy cats. So what Eisenhower does as president is um, he turns the city of Little Rock into, you know, he lets the, the paratroopers and 10,000 National Guardsmen into this city to say, hey, these kids are going to school. You're going to protect them. And for that entire school year, yeah. The National Guard are there with every one of those kids in every class, in every hall, at every door. Now, that didn't mean that stuff didn't happen inside the building to these kids. I mean, you had students who were raised to believe a set of racist principles. Unfortunately, it was not an easy year for these students, but it was the beginning of the end of this system. In 1960, we see there is a, well, it's a presidential election year. Uh, Eisenhower had run two terms. He had done well for two terms. And now it was time for clean slate option. Eisenhower's vice president, Republican Richard Nixon, is on the ballot, but so is the young single-term Democrat, John Kennedy. Now, this was a real up-in-the-air thing, if you were looking at both of these guys. Because, you know, Nixon had the history of, well, they both had a history of being involved in the war. Nixon, hugely anti-communist, involved in the Hiss scandal, uh, but the, prosecuting, he had been vice president, and he seemed like a golden slate. Kennedy, he's young, he's handsome, very limited experience, though, and he was a Catholic. And in when they're running in 60, that was, for people, a discerning issue. There were people who believed that because of his religious outlook he would take control of the government in a specific way. So some people voted for him or against him because of, of religion. In the end, Kennedy wins. And the big thing that leads to Kennedy's victory is, is twofold. Number one, he makes his greatest rival this senator from Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson, his running mate, and says, yeah, he and I, we don't always see eye to eye, but we have the same end goal. So people who are looking at this, they think, wow, I mean, if this guy's willing to bury a hatchet with, with, his, with his rival, maybe he's willing to stand for some other stuff. Maybe he's willing to work for larger things. That was big thing number one. Big thing number two is this was the first ever televised debate. And Kennedy had been around cameras his whole life. I mean, his father had been a movie producer. So he was used to, you know, knowing how to work a camera and work an audience. Ken Nixon hadn't. Um, and... When the debate starts, the questions go to each candidate, and Kennedy is smiling, he's knowledgeable, he's, he's witty, and he's got a, an answer for everything. 
Nixon, though, is stunned by the cameras. He's kind of, if you ever watch these debates, he was almost shy on camera. He gives one word answers, very curt, very straight to the point. He doesn't elaborate on a lot of things. And when it's a question like, what should our foreign policy be, for example, you kind of want a detailed answer. You don't want someone to just say, we should expand on it and stop talking. So it made people think Nixon was unqualified. These two things together led to the Kennedy victory. And when you look at the popular votes between the two, I mean, we're looking at 100,000 people's votes. That's it. In some of these states, it's down to only a few thousand people voting one way or another. But that was it, and that was enough. And that was what led to Kennedy's victory in 60. And that ends our look at the 1950s. We've been looking at the age of affluence. We've seen how this country was changed and shaped by the economic transformations that took place from a foreign, from a domestic, internal, external view. Hope you learned something today. I'll see you next time.